I think that most people would agree that bouldering, unlike sport climbing or mountaineering, is an anaerobic sport, at least for the most part. That means that our efforts are over so quickly, we don't really need the presence of oxygen to fuel our power output. But is that really true? And what happens in between our attempts? Today, we have decided to do a fun but admittedly chance experiment that would show if oxygen and indirectly our oxidative energy systems are required for bouldering performance. So today we're gonna to be using this hypoxic machine. The reason why I've actually got this is for an expedition in preparation. So effectively what it's gonna do is we're gonna change the valve pressure and the flow meter, effectively changing the oxygen in the air that Johnny is gonna receive during the climbing session. Every couple of minutes, I'm gonna check our O2 saturation using this device. Effectively, it's gonna tell us how much oxygen is in the blood and what our heart rate is. So at the moment, you can see, because I'm talking, uh, my heart rate's at about 78 beats per minute and my O2 saturation is very normal at 99, 98. So you'll see that going down and down and down. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when it becomes more extreme later on. We're looking at taking all of the readings just before he climbs, just after he climbs, after two minutes rest, at which point I'm gonna crank up the oxygen. The reason we're doing so many readings is we're really interested to see the oxygen depth that he gets from climbing. So bouldering is an anaerobic effort. It means you're not really using much oxygen on the wall but we can see how much oxygen debt he's in and how much time he takes to recover at different heights. As we go through this experiment, Ollie is gonna increase the altitude by a thousand meters at a time. We've got some real world reference points in there for you to compare it to. And do please comment if you've bouldered at any of these locations or maybe these altitudes or higher. It'd be really cool to see how high you guys have actually bouldered. To give you a reference point at sea level, we're looking for around 21% oxygen in the air. So when we go up to about Leadville in Colorado, which is at 10,200 feet, that's 3,100 meters, we're having around 14.3% oxygen in the air. Now the highest climbing wall that we're aware of is in Bolivia. That's around 4,000 meters and around 13% oxygen. We're gonna try and take it higher today. So right now we're gonna get a baseline set of readings. So Johnny's just completed the climb, first time up without a mask on. Uh, and we're going to look at a couple of different measures. So O2 saturation, what have you got? Uh, 99% at the moment. 99, so that's really normal. Uh, heart rate? Is uh, about 100. 100, so that's kind of high, but considering we're sitting down, but he has just done the climb, so that's very normal. Um, rate of effort for your first climb, time doing it? Uh, that was probably like six or seven. The first bit of altitude we're going to go to is around a thousand meters. So that's about Chamonix in France, around 18 and a half percent oxygen. So we're only dropping it slightly to begin with. So first effort, RP climbing still the same, but he's just said he can already feel it now. But what I can already tell is when he's come off the wall, the O2 sats have dropped and then they're going to increase slightly. O2 is around 97 and heart rate's 98. So one thing that's really interesting is when I first put this on, when Johnny first sat down, O2 was around 91 and his heart rate was 110. And you could tell that he felt a lot different then and already starting to recover. So that shows that even though bouldering is an anaerobic effort, you have this oxygen debt after climbing, and then you need that time to recover. So you can already see that real dip in O2, a real spike in his heart rate, and then it's starting to stabilize. So we've just had about a minute's rest it's already jumping straight back up to previous heights. Obviously we are a bit higher now, but we're gonna keep expecting to see the oxygen depth, the heart rate response, try and get oxygen around the body after trying to climb, and then also going back into recovery mode. So we'll see how good Johnny's recovery actually is. We're now at 3,000 meters, which is Leadville, Colorado. Most people struggle over three and a half thousand meters. Johnny seems to be relatively normal so far. So I think the next round will be really telling.
So 132 is the highest heart rate, 82 sets, dropped to 76, the lowest. So you can see his O2 sats going from 76 and it's slowly starting to recover as he's getting oxygen into the body. This is why it's so important for even boulders to have a relatively good aerobic fitness so they can recover faster between attempts and why 30 seconds isn't enough rest. So Johnny's just said it's harder to get his breath back. So obviously he's really trying now to recover between attempts. He's only having four minutes off the wall, but it's already feeling quite hard to do that. So we're now cranked up to 4,000 meters, similar to El Alto in Bolivia. It's probably quite interesting to say that actually if you went into hospital with O2 saturations under 90, you would be rushed into A&E or intensive care because that is a sign of something that's really serious. So a lot of people that really suffer from illnesses will be in the low 90s. Um, and they will be really taken care of. Now this is a normal reaction for uh, the body at altitude, but it shows that how much effort is going in to recover now at these different altitudes. But so far it seems like Johnny's pretty good considering it's 4,000 meters. We're at 5,000 meters now, Everest Base Camp. This for me is when it kind of gets a little bit serious, so I'm gonna definitely keep an eye on things. Well done. Thank you. Good job. Oh, it's so thick. <laughs> <laughs> it's like air soup. <laughs> oh, I feel funnier now taking it off. A bit of head rash. Yeah. Because you have like a bunch of oxygen. Yeah, which obviously you normally get from like standing up and moving around too much, but I've literally just sat in exactly the same place, which is quite interesting. Quite interesting that the climb itself didn't feel too different and almost like the learned effect of doing multiple goes um, and becoming more familiar with it didn't make it any harder and if anything made it a bit easier on some of the attempts. Um, but what was quite interesting was the initial response when I got off the wall was like, I was like, oh yeah, that just feels normal. And then within about 10 seconds, I could feel my heart really going and like my breathing rate was starting to increase a lot more. Um, my body was obviously just trying to get as much oxygen in as it could uh, and get rid of the carbon dioxide. Um, yeah, which is quite interesting. So what did we actually find out? Well, as you could see, his O2 saturations, the amount of oxygen in his blood really started to plummet as we went much higher. And then as he started to recover, he had two minutes off the wall before we increased the height that oxygen started to stabilize again and his heart rate started to stabilize as well and start to lower down. Now, this is the thing I think is really interesting. If we were going to get Johnny to try a projecting and just kept getting back on the boulder without having much rest and he wanted to keep trying moves and only had maybe 20, 30 seconds rest, you would see his recovery would be really, really, really bad. So that extra time makes a massive difference when you're at altitude. I also wanted to see whether this still worked for a control. So if, does this happen at sea level? So I did exactly the same protocol, but without using the altitude, much easier for me. And that means that I can see whether I had the same response. Fundamentally, I didn't. You still have the same heart rate response, trying to get oxygen around the body and trying to recover quickly, but you can see my heart rate dropped really rapidly back to its baseline and the O2 saturation stayed exactly the same as sea level throughout the entire session. I think our little experiment showed us a few different interesting findings. Firstly, short powerful boulders are very anaerobic because even in the absence of oxygen, performance was barely impacted. This might change, however, if the boulder was longer or maybe more maximal for Johnny. Secondly, Johnny incurred what looked like an oxygen debt as seen in the drop in his oxygen saturation immediately after climbing. This was followed by a gradual increase back to a plateau, but this took a lot longer to recover relative to Ollie doing the same test at low altitude. We can't say that Ollie didn't incur an oxygen debt based on the values of oxygen saturation, as we'd not really expect to see these drop when doing short, moderate exercise. I think we need to look at measures of respiratory gas analysis or breathing rate to get a better picture of what was going on. Something more sensitive than blood oxygen saturation. I think the oxygen debt was only obvious with Johnny because the saturation was so low to start with that there wasn't enough oxygen in his circulation to deal with what was likely only a small oxygen debt. 
Finally, and probably the most actionable takeaway from this is if you find yourself bouldering at altitude like Rocky Mountain National Park, rest longer than you might otherwise do habitually. We know that acute recovery of your anaerobic energy systems need oxygen and are linked to your aerobic capacity. And Johnny's oxygen saturation was significantly impacted above 2000 meters. It's not a direct measure, but it's a safe bet to say that recovery is impacted at altitude, even for bouldering. Take this even more seriously if you're on long boulders. We're absolutely obsessed with exploring the science of training. And if you are too, you might be interested in our online course, A Climber's Guide to Training. There's over eight hours of content in there, more than a hundred different lessons. And the best bit is you get a downloadable training plan template and resources to build your own plan. If you're at all interested, just check out the link in the description below. Again, thanks for watching the video and we'll see you next time.